see all of you today. Greetings and welcome to all of you here and to those who are joining us, worshiping with us online. Please take a moment to check out the announcements and the prayer list uh, that were listed on the announcement sheet uh, this morning. It should be uh, in the narthex. Dwayne, yes. is your mic on? Nope, I just didn't turn it on. <laughs> it was on earlier. I must have turned it off and forgot. I'm sorry. So the, uh, the announcements in the prayer list that are out in the narthex, please check those out. Especially the one uh, that points out that we're working on collecting funds right now for mission buckets to be sent to Zimbabwe. Our goal is to assemble at least 48 buckets. It costs about $20 per bucket, and you can give online by scanning the QR code on, with your phone that's on the, the, the sheet out there, or you can put a check in the offering plate and uh, put on the note line buckets, uh, and uh, that'll uh, get to the same spot. Also, don't forget about all the ways you can connect virtually to Jones Memorial right now, the upper room, and the worship song devotions are uh, listed each, each week. Wednesday night connect beginning at 5.30 with a uh, Zoom fellowship meal, and then all the opportunities after that for uh, our uh, people of all ages uh, to, uh, to study. And then there's Jones Kids Awana on Sunday night. Uh, Next Sunday is Mother's Day, and we're going to start early, just so you can prepare your love this week for your mothers. I'm so bored. I wish I had something to do. <sighs> Thanks for letting me sleep in, kids. If you make a mess in the kitchen, please let me know so I can clean it up. Raising kids is so easy. I just love driving around all day. Oh, I never have to repeat myself. They always listen so carefully. Oh, look, an empty box of cereal. Love it. Just wipe it on your sleeve. It's pretty cold, but you don't need a coat. Oh, you don't have to push in your chair. Don't make your bed. You're just gonna sleep in it again later. I think I'll skip the coffee today. You know, these throw pillows look way better on the floor. I'm really not that busy. Well, you haven't showered in three days, but I think you smell great. We do have food at home, but let's just go out to eat. Just brush your teeth whenever you feel like it. Here, take my phone charger and go put it in your room. Oh, just leave your dirty dishes on the counter. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's all pull on our phones. Youth sports are so cheap. Braces are so cheap. School fees are so cheap. Hey, can you come crawl in bed with me around 2 a.m.? Thanks. Okay, I just spent two hours making dinner, but if you don't like it, that's fine. Just let me know and I'll make you something else. Don't even bother looking for that. I'm sure it's lost and gone forever. Can somebody please throw something at my head? I mean, I can keep track of every single one of your things. I get a ton of sleep. I get a ton of gratitude from my children. I get a ton of unsolicited help with the housework. Oh, you don't have to hurry up. We're gonna be right on time. Can someone please throw something at the TV? Thanks for doing the laundry, everyone. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you use your outside voice? Ah! Fight, fight, ah! fight! The floor of this vehicle is so clean, I can't believe it. Oh, good. Another trip to the grocery store today. Let's go. Somebody want to come use the bathroom while I'm in here? Amen. <laughs> we love our moms. Now, would you receive this call to worship? Who is wise and understanding among us? Those who seek wisdom and understanding each and every day. Those who delight in God and meditate on God's law. Come learn more about the wisdom from above a wisdom that yields a harvest of righteousness. Oh God, your wisdom is more precious than jewels. We draw near to you. Amen. Here's a word from our children's Good director. Good morning, my little Jones kids. I am so happy to be here with you today in worship. You know, when I was a kid, I always heard sharing is caring. And I love sharing. I really love sharing when I'm sharing the good stuff. When it brings a smile to someone's face. But if we don't have the good stuff, what do we do? We have to get it. 
And the same thing goes to sharing God's wisdom. If we don't have it, we can't share it. So the best way for us to be able to become firm in our foundation and to be able to share that love and wisdom with others is to seek it ourselves. And the best way to do that is by spending time with God every day. So I hope that you get the good stuff from God, from our amazing God from above, and share it with others this week. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come into your presence in this house with our fellow friends and family. Father, ask your blessings upon this service. Bless our pastor as she brings the message. Speak to our hearts, Father. May we have open minds and open hearts to receive your word. Father, we pray for those on our prayer list. We ask for your healing touch to touch them and heal them in mighty ways, Father, and may they know that it was your hand who touched them. Father God, we ask you to continue to be with the ministries of this church as we gather back together after so long apart. Father, may it be seamless. May we flow with your Holy Spirit. And Father, we ask that as we take the opportunity to give, we give from our hearts, we give from the generosity that you have shown us. And we ask your blessings in all these ways. In Jesus' name, amen.
I forgot to turn my mic too, Dwayne. 14 months, y'all. 14 months since we've heard the choir. Wasn't that nice? Yes. Thank you. And they, uh, this is just part of them so that we can, uh, they can sing together and um, say, do that safely. And uh, there's going to be another group working up some more music. Uh, so <clears throat> we'll hear, uh, hear from, from them again, which is wonderful. Thank you, Duane. Thank you, choir. Uh, thank you to all of you who will be singing uh, soon in the next group. <clears throat> And thank you for uh, seeking to do that safely uh, so that we can have uh, the, basically the best of both worlds, really. We are uh, continuing our study of James. This is the third week, and this uh, morning we are moving into the third chapter. We're going to move to the end of the third chapter this morning and, um, and uh, the beginning of the fourth chapter. So I'm going to start reading this morning in verse 13 and, and go right on into the fourth chapter. Hear now this word from James. Are any of you wise and understanding? Show that your actions are good with a humble lifestyle that comes from wisdom. However, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, then stop bragging and living in ways that deny the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. Instead, it is from the earth, natural and demonic. Wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and everything that is evil. What of the wisdom from above? First, it is pure and then peaceful, gentle, obedient, filled with mercy and good actions, fair and genuine. Those who make peace sow the seeds of justice by their peaceful acts. What is the source of conflict among you? What is the source of your disputes? Don't they come from your cravings that are at war in your own lives? You long for something you don't have, so you commit murder. You are jealous for something you can't get, so you struggle and fight. You don't have because you don't ask. You, don't, you ask and don't have because you ask with evil intentions to waste it on your own cravings. Therefore, James says, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will run away from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we've been digging into the book of James for a few weeks now, and as we continue our study of this book, I want to spend a few moments this morning sharing some details about the book as a whole. We don't know exactly which James it was who wrote uh, this book. Some say it's James, the brother of Jesus, or James, the disciple, but because it's nearly impossible to pinpoint the date that this book was written that also makes it difficult to know exactly who wrote the book. In any case, though, James is considered by many to be a letter, sort of like Paul's letters to the Colossians or the Corinthians or the Romans. And that would be um, an, an understandable conclusion because James opens with kind of these standard greetings that you would see in a letter written to a group of people. However, the book of James ends pretty abruptly, very quickly. It doesn't have the, the parting greetings like many of Paul's letters do, no closing remarks. And so that, that's sort of baffling. It doesn't make much sense, and it makes you wonder if it, if it is a letter or maybe if it's only part of a letter and we're missing part of it or, or something like that. In any case, though, whether it is a letter or not a letter, one thing we know for sure is that it is what's called a, a uh, called wisdom literature, um, and it's the only such wisdom literature that's in the New Testament. Now, so you understand what wisdom writings are, uh, the wisdom books in the Old Testament are Job and Psalms and Proverbs and the Song of Solomon and Ecclesiastes. 
So James falls into sort of that ilk, but it's the only wisdom writing in, in, um, in the New Testament, and it's offered in the form of moral exhortation. And so within the first 108 verses of this, this letter, this book, there are 54 imperatives. So half <laughs> out of the first 108 verses, at least half of them are telling us we need to do something, right? Uh, which might explain why sometimes we feel like maybe James is a little bit difficult to swallow or to follow even. Um, and it might also be why it's not so popular as most of Paul's writings are, uh, because it actually asks something of us. It requires something of us. It, it, it makes us need maybe to change something about ourselves. Anyway, I share all of that with you this morning as we dig into chapters three and four, because what James does here is he lays out this stark contrast between the way it is and the way it should be. Now, as we consider the way things should be, I want you uh, to think with me for a minute about a time when maybe you yourself or someone you know received maybe a tough medical diagnosis. And maybe that diagnosis included the revelation that, that this disease perhaps might have been doing damage in the body for several years. I've stood by a lot of bedsides in my years as a pastor and I've seen people dealing with, with lots of different ailments and, and surgeries. Some, sometimes people had just learned they had heart disease or maybe they'd received a, a stage four cancer diagnosis and a bad prognosis along with that. And sometimes this information came even as the people were carrying on happy, seemingly healthy, very full lives. You know, as I would imagine most of you are aware, it is entirely possible for someone to think and feel that they are perfectly healthy when in fact they are walking around with some disease eating away inside of them. This is what James is talking about, except in this case, it's not a physical illness, of course. It, he's talking though about a spiritual sickness. He even names it bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. And what James is talking about is a spirit which is always criticizing, a spirit which can't let a nice, by, a nice word go by without a nasty one. What's interesting though is that the problem is not only in this spirit of negativity, the problem is compounded when such a spirit claims to be healthy, claims, for instance, to be Christian. James' rebuke of such false claims is unequivocal. That in boasting, such, person, such persons are telling lies that deny the truth. But it doesn't stop there because the sickness, James says, goes even deeper. And you'll remember last week we talked about taming the tongue. We talked about James' claim that the tongue is like a small flame that can set a whole forest on fire. Now in the 15th verse of chapter three, James essentially says that the misguided wisdom that drives such negative language is worldly. And he even calls it demonic of the devil. It may sound like true wisdom, but James wants to make sure we understand that it absolutely is not. And so we are faced with a choice, with two kinds of wisdom, worldly wisdom and what James calls wisdom from above. Well, think about it this way. Several years ago, I had a friend who who refused to wear a seatbelt 
any time we were riding in the car together, I would always say something, my friends would say something, encouraging her to, to, to buckle up. Anyone else in the car would, would do the same. We, we nagged her pretty incessantly, but it was always to no avail. And this went on for several years. And then one day, she climbed in the car, reached back behind her, and pulled the seatbelt across her lap, buckled up. Now, after my friends and I had, you know, picked our jaws up off the floorboard, someone said, what happened to you? She said, last week, I went to see a friend of mine in the hospital. He was in a car crash and he went through the windshield. She said he had like 200 stitches all over his face. And she said, seeing him like that, I have no problem buckling up. Now, I was a little confused. So I said, well, I mean, is that new information? But like, what changed you? Surely you knew. Didn't you know that unbuckled people fly through windshields when there's an accident? And of course, I knew the answer to that question, and, and so did she. But what happened was that an idea suddenly became a reality, an actual experience. It's only when you attach some truth that real life changes. The great preacher Jonathan Edwards said that. It's only when you attach to some truth that real life change occurs. Something has to become real in your heart and then you will be changed. We can have worldly wisdom, but it's not enough. And, and in fact, it might be really bad, really misguided. And if we live only by that worldly wisdom, it could be devastating. But even beyond that, think about what happens in our words, our attitudes, our actions, when we perpetuate the misguided worldly wisdom. Think about it not only in terms of things like wearing a seatbelt or, or other safety measures, but also in terms of everything that's going on in the world around us. Right? There's so many things wrong with our world, aren't there? I'd imagine most of us feel some frustration about something nearly every day. You know, maybe we're fed up with the way the country is run or the, or, or the global economy or the way people treat one another. And our criticisms may be fully justified as they would have been in James' day. But the challenge for God's people is to tell the truth about the way the world is and about the way wicked people are behaving without turning into a perpetual grumble. And especially without ourselves becoming, becoming someone whose appearance of wisdom actually consists in just worldly wisdom, right? Where we're just finding a cutting word to say about everyone and everything. So in short, our challenge, our task as Christians is to be people who share wisdom from above, not people who just propagate the wisdom and the ways of the world. So how do we do this? This is one of those things that's a lot easier to say than to do. And the first step is to remember that we live in a world that is created by God. And when God created this world, he looked at everything that he had made. And what did he call it? Good. He created it and he said, this is good. And despite all the bad that we see in the world, there is still a vast amount of beauty and love and generosity and sheer goodness in the world. We have to open our eyes to see that. And then we have to be people who name it and celebrate it 
right? That's part of sharing the worldly, the wisdom from above. I mean, instead of the negativity of worldly wisdom. This is simply, really, I mean, when you think about it, this is simply a matter of being optimistic in our lives rather than pessimistic. And, you know, we should be optimistic people because we are people of God. We are people of, we are citizens of, of the hope and the promise of God's kingdom. But even more than seeing and naming all that is good, we also have to live in that way ourselves. We have to embody and enact God's wisdom, the wisdom from above. And the good news is James tells us exactly what that looks like here at the end of chapter 3. What is wisdom from above, he says? First, it is pure. And then peaceful, gentle, obedient, filled with mercy and good actions. There it is again, good actions. Fair and genuine. He says those who make peace sow the seeds of justice by their peaceful acts. In other words, wisdom from above focuses on making this world look like the kingdom from above, God's kingdom. And much like we said last week, wisdom from above is about building others up, building our world up, not tearing it down. Now, this is a lot. It's a lot for every single one of us to be pure and peaceful and gentle, to be filled with mercy and good actions, fair and genuine. You know, I don't know about you all, but I'm lucky if I hit one of those a week, one a week, much less all of those every single day. And so again, we might ask, how do we do this? And again, James gives us an answer. At the very end of the passage I read this morning, so beautiful and so simple, he says, come near to God and he will come near to you. We see the task before us as an either or battle. We understand our task as overcoming worldly wisdom with wisdom from above, but we have to remember that God works at both ends. Whether principalities or powers, whether heights or depths, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, Paul says. God has already overcome worldly wisdom in our Savior Jesus Christ. God has already conquered with wisdom from above. And all we need, all we need is to come near to God in faith. And isn't it wonderful to think, to know that when we come near to God, God will come near to us. This morning, as we think about drawing near to God, one of the best ways we have to do that is in communion. The last act of Christ before he was betrayed was to draw his disciples around him in this seemingly ordinary act of sharing a meal. But he said, when you do this meal, when you share this bread and this cup, I will be present with you in a special and particular way as you remember how I have overcome worldly wisdom. So let us join together this morning in the great thanksgiving. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. 
This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and again giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood that we might have gentleness born of wisdom. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now let us pray together as Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of this one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in Christ's own life blood. And now I invite you to share these elements together. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. This is the blood of Christ poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. We submit ourselves to you. Grant that in the strength of your spirit, we may go into the world to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Just a quick word, when you all exit, there, there are trash cans by the doors and you can drop the, the communion cups in there. And now let us uh, continue in worship as we hear this music from Tina. I invite you to stand.
As we leave uh, this morning, the ushers will help you exit by the side aisles and will empty from the back of the sanctuary uh, to the front, just to make sure we do that safely. So, so be on the lookout for the ushers to sort of uh, guide you out. And now will you receive this benediction. As you go into the world today, may you go hearing and heeding God's wisdom and sharing the good news of God's wisdom in all the world. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.